Can genetically engineered crops, a breakthrough technology in agriculture that's still controversy over two decades after its introduction, end world hunger? Or is there a bigger issue at stake here? Joining me now from San Francisco is Raj Patel, a food policy expert and advisor to the UN on this very important issue. He's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Value of Nothing. Raj Patel, welcome to The Heat. Raj, I'm excited to talk to you because I've never heard anyone describe this issue in such a visual term as you do when you talk about the hourglass. Can you go over that for our audience? Sure. If you imagine in the world today, there are millions of farmers around the world who are growing food and 7 billion people around the world who try to eat every day if we can. But between the farmers and the millions of consumers around the world, uh, there are just a handful of corporations that control the global movement of food. And in every major market, uh, about six companies control uh, uh, over 50% of the global market. Uh, and that concentration of power puts uh, these food companies in a, a, a tremendous position in deciding not only what it is that we get marketed to eat, but what it is that gets grown in the fields. And if we're interested in questions about how it is that we're going to feed the world tomorrow, we really do need to be asking the question about who it is that has the power over the food system today. Uh, and that's why I think this, this hourglass figure of wide at the top, narrow in the middle, wide at the bottom, uh, is a helpful way of us uh, helping us understand what the global food system looks like. So when you say wide, that's all the farmers, and when you say wide, that's all the people that need food, and then clogging it in the middle is this little select group. How do we widen that? Well, I mean, historically, of course, there have been markets that effectively connect farmers to consumers. Uh, and, you know, those, you know, th th those local markets uh, still exist in many parts of the world. But when it comes to global trade, uh, the connections between farmers and consumers have been very much attenuated. There's a long, thin line between farmers in one part of the world and consumers in another. Uh, and there are mechanisms which we could use today to help widen that, that pinch point in the food system uh, simply by undertaking antitrust uh, legislation. I mean, we have plenty of legislation on the books that suggests that when one company controls 90% of something, for example, uh, we would want to break that monopoly because it's not in the interests of consumers to have one corporation lording it over them in, in that particular way. Uh, me... And if you look at the, the food system, in fact, there is a corporation that has a 90% monopoly, and that, that corporation is Monsanto. Uh, if you look at genetically modified crops, uh, Monsanto's technology is either in the seeds or licensed to 90% of the genetically modified modified seeds uh, on, the, on the market today. And that looks like, uh, like a monopoly in, in, in every important way. Well, you know, I want to get to that in, in just a bit. But let's, let's talk about uh, prices of food. Uh, mm -hmm. They've soared in recent years nearly 40% in 2010 alone. What are the contributing factors to that? And, and should there be more of a focus on ending world hunger and less of a focus on profits, perhaps? Oh, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, if, if you look at the reasons in 2010, you had a, a range of factors. You had climate change, you had uh, speculation in, in financial markets, you had uh, depleted grain reserves, uh, you had a, a range of, of factors. You had uh, policies that were diverting food, uh, not to, to, to be turned into, uh, I mean, crops not to be turned into food, but instead to be turned into biofuel. In other words, we were growing food not to eat it, but to set it on fire. Uh, and that's a, a very important policy that's diverting a lot of uh, food away from feeding the hungry uh, to be able instead to, to, to using it in, uh, as fuel for vehicles. And now when you put these the, the, the sort of spectacular range of policies and external shocks together, uh, what you had was a recipe for food prices going way up. And the tragedy was uh, that not only were food prices going up, but people's income was going down. And I think this is one of the, the important issues to understand when we're interested in tackling world hunger. It's important to realize today that even in 2010, we had in some crops record harvests. We had very high levels of these crops available on global markets, but their prices was, were being forced up by a range of factors. And the trouble is that the reason people went hungry, and around a billion people were malnourished in 2010, the reason for that was not because of a shortage of crops, but because of poverty. And so if we're interested in ending, ending hunger, uh, we need to be thinking a lot more about fighting poverty rather than producing more food from the ground. Because right now, we have more calories per person than ever before in human history. You know, one of the interesting things that, that, that you're seeing is this groundswell that's happening around the world where people are, are trying to make this more democratic. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. One of the ways in which uh, many people, from uh, peasant movements in the global south uh, to foodies in here in San Francisco, uh, the, the ways that the people are trying to circumvent uh, the the power that corporations have on the global food system is to eat more locally and to be more connected to their farmers. And I think that that's a that's a great thing uh, because uh, by understanding where food comes from, one builds a, a, an increased respect for it, and one understands the labor and the environmental costs and the social costs that go into producing good, clean food. The trouble is, of course, that this means uh, that this, eating locally doesn't in and of itself uh, help to break the, the monopoly power that corporations have. And so people have been realizing that one of the other things that we have to do is not only change our individual lifestyle, but change the rules of a very rigged and broken global food system. And so across the world, for example, you have uh, the international peasant movement, La Via Campesina, which uh, means the peasant way. And over 200 million farmers, farm workers, and landless peasants are part of this movement. And what they're trying to do uh, is take on some of these big agricultural corporations but they're also promoting some really exciting ways of farming that are not about genetically modified crops, but are actually about uh, what's called agroecological farming. And I think this is interesting because it, we're often told that if we're having a, a world population of t you know, 9 billion people by 2050, how are we going to feed those people? And that's where the GM crop lobby will step in and say, we, we need genetically modified crops. Well, if you look at the studies that have been conducted, and there's a terrific study called the International Agricultural Assessment on Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the study itself uh, points to the fact that if we're going to feed the world in 2050, then genetically modified crops really aren't a part of that picture. But what is a part of that picture is a kind of farming that is more local, uh, more urban and peri-urban, and that hedges bets against climate change by not having a single crop in you know, long rows, but having polycultures of growing several crops together to uh, minimize water use, to increase soil fertility, to reduce pesticide impact. Uh, and what you have instead is a vision of the future that's not about large corporations, but a way of feeding cities that is much more about uh, a sustainable, robust agriculture that addresses not only the issues around pesticide and production, but also it addresses issues of distribution. And that's where this democratic uh, movement is very, very important. Because if you're not addressing this issue of how food gets distributed, then you find yourself in a world like we're in today, where you can have plenty of food, but still having, having a billion people going hungry. Raj, we've got about 30 seconds. I know that uh, you think about hunger every day. You're working on another book on this issue. And yet we have World Hunger Day, where everybody else in the world kind of, oh, wow. Um, how do we make this more top of mind, would you say, in about 20 seconds? And I know that's a tough one, but if you can. Well, I, I think. Uh, Understanding that when you see homeless and hungry people on the streets, the reason is not because of a shortage of food, because, because of poverty. I think flipping that switch in your head suddenly opens up the world to the number of things that we can do. Raj, thank you so much for joining us from San Francisco. Certainly appreciate it. Mike, it's a pleasure.